All right, guys, welcome to this video. In this video, we'll be covering the BIMA um, section two value section. Uh, and basically, the aim of these series of video, guys, is, is to systematically run through the different topics and the different questions that were asked in the past. So you have, you know, a step by step guide on, you know, how to answer the BMAT questions topic by topic. So without further ado, guys, let's get straight into it. So first, you guys, I just want to talk about the some of the most common topics that come up in um, BMAT section two um, biology. And it's really important you practice these topic tests because they come in year in, year out, and they easy marks more or less all the time covering the same type of ideas. So these are inheritance, which we're going to get to in uh, future videos. Uh, homeostasis, again, going to get to this uh, in future uh, videos. Cell division. Uh, and, and yeah, these are basically the three most common ones. Uh, so if you're going to watch any of these videos, guys, make sure you watch these uh, videos, which are going to come later on in the series. But what we're going to do um, in this video, guys, is we're going to... Uh, cover um, the questions uh, for cells. Um, so the type of things they um, expect you to know on this topic is just like, you know, um, just what's the, what's the general format of the cells and how cells are organized into tissues, organs, and uh, you know, this, all the details guys are in the BMAT specification, which I highly recommend uh, you print out um, and you use as a checklist to see, do I know this, do I know that? Because thing is guys, uh, if you're coming in as, you know, um, uh, future medical students or biological natural sciences students you would know a lot of these uh, different stuff from your a-levels but they have a few niche things that work over the gcc but uh, maybe not um, at a level hence it's really important that you use that as a checklist so first you guys we're going to cover um bmat 2018 and this was question 13 so basically roughly guys um the bmat the beginning questions are generally quite easy mid all right meh and then the last ones are generally generally tend to be a bit hard um so 13 out of 27, uh, it should be all right. So it says the diagram shows three different types of animal cells. So you have epithelial cells. And basically all epithelial cells are, guys, uh, you probably heard of them like uh, in the context of the, the lining of the uh, airways. So you have your, you know, you have your airways. And then one of these cells on this line would be an epithelial cell because it's the barrier between. So if you follow this airway, it's going to eventually lead to the outside world and the inside world, which is on this side, going to be your tissue. So that's basically what an epithelial cell is. Um, then next you have your um, mature red blood cell, which is just a bag of hemoglobin, which carries oxygen uh, around the body. And then you have your muscle cells, which obviously aid bone movement. Um, and this is which of these cells is or are found as part of the tissue. So um, if you want to um, give this a tip, pause the video now, uh, give it a go. Uh, remember, uh, remember guys, time yourself from day one. So give yourself a minute, come back and you can go through the solution. So welcome back, guys. Hopefully you've uh, given that a go. Um, so let's go for it systematically. So we need to know, to answer this question, what is a tissue? A tissue is a group of cells that work together for a common, essentially a common goal. So they, so they all work together for a common goal. So epithelial cells, um, so this line, I just drew one of the epithelial cells. There'll be many epithelial cells uh, down this track, guys. So you have a group of cells there. So you've met that condition. But are they working together? Yes, they are working together. Um, and they're working together to provide a barrier function, uh, essentially to prevent your cell from being infected by, you know, viruses and all the other nasty stuff, right? So this one is definitely part of a tissue. Uh, number two, mature red blood cell. So this is where a lot of people, a lot of my students uh, that I've taught before have um, been getting some confusion. So when I say, guys, a group of cells, it doesn't necessarily mean the cells have to be connected, right? Uh, they can just be, you know, um, they can just be separate, as are red blood cells in the mud, aren't they? So, but they're still a group of cells, right? They don't have to be connected. And again, they all have a, um, red blood cells have a common goal of delivering oxygen uh, to your peripheral tissues. Hence, this is also um, a type of tissue. Uh, red blood cells is a form of tissue. And muscle cells, this one is, um, so it, obviously in your muscle, right? You're going to have a load of these muscle cells um, connected up. And then each one shortening is going to cause your macroscopic movement that you can see, which is going to, you know, you move your bones. So this is also um, part of the tissue. So the answer here, guys, is um, H. So the, the the learning point here, guys, is really understand what the definition in the BMAT specification is telling you. Um, you really have to, because what the whole point of the BMAT, it's not hard content wise. It's just that they're going to really, um, test if you've critically understood what you read and you know um using your time etc 
So hopefully that was useful, guys, and I'll see you back in the next video. So guys, uh, welcome back. Uh, I remember in the previous video, we done the BMAT 2018 uh, paper, which we uh, learned a couple of good stuff from. So let's go to the next um, sales question. This was a BMAT 2015. Uh, so question 21, so we can, um, it might be a bit hard, might not. So let's uh, check, guys. So mitochondria is of aerobic respiration in animal cells. So you've probably heard of the, you know, energy factory idea. A theory of the evolution of animal cells states that these mitochondria may once have been aerobic bacteria that were taken into the cytoplasm of a cell in an early ancestor of the animals, allowing the cells to gain the ability to respire using oxygen. So basically what this thing, whole thing over here, guys, is talking about is something which is called the endosymbiotic symbiotic theory right and um that theory goes as above that so basically what happens in this theory is that you know you have you, you have an animal cell and this animal cell was basically hungry once upon a time and it basically ate a bacteria now what you have to know about aerobic bacteria guys is they have all these enzymes and proteins you require for aerobic respiration on their plasma membranes in like you know special areas which are called mesosomes so um this area over here will be called a mesosome right and basically the animal cell um gobbles that up so basically when it gobbles up and engulfs it you basically have the bacteria uh like that and then this is enclosed within a further membrane which is derived from the plasma membrane following engulfment right and basically um the support for this theory is that basically they're saying that this is how this is how the mitochondria in the animal cell um, was derived and and the evidence for that is that mitochondria are roughly the size of bacteria and hence why obviously bacteria don't have mitochondria because the it's basically the same size uh, and again another point of evidence is that the proteins and enzymes required for aerobic respiration are found in the inner membrane as we can see over there and yeah this this lines up with you know what we can see in this diagram so it says assuming this theory is correct which of the following statements are true of these aerobic bacteria and human white blood cells so why don't you guys um pause the video give it a go and come back and we can look at the answer so welcome back guys um let's consider this so um point number one it says the structure of the dna is a double helix dna by definition guys wh whether it be from fungi and animal cell plants or whatever it's always going to be a double helix so this has to be correct um uh, they would both possess a cell wall so um bacteria certainly possess a cell wall but um animal cells human cells don't uh, and um, human white blood cells they don't possess cell wall so this would be incorrect and the next one they would both possess a nucleus okay so um, whilst human cells obviously have nuclei, human white blood cells are going to have nuclei, um, bacteria don't have nuclei, right? Because um, bacteria basically just have their DNA just naked in their looped around, so they don't have a nucleus. So this is going to be incorrect. And um, they would both possess a cell membrane. Uh, yes, that's true. Any living organism has to have a cell membrane in order to, you know, transport and communicate with this external environment. So this is going to be... So you see, guys, as I'm going through the options, I'm reasoning why is this one incorrect? Um, what, how can I change the statement to make it correct? And that's a really good habit to get to into practice. Uh, it's, it's a form of revision. So, um, yeah, the answer here, guys, would be one and four. So the answer would be A. Um, wasn't too difficult for, a, you know, um, terminal stage question. Uh, but hopefully that has made sense, guys. And I look forward to seeing you in the next question. So see you in a little more, guys. Okay, guys, welcome back. In the last um, section, we were looking at BMAT 2015, this question regarding the endosymbiotic theory. So we uh, move on, guys. So what we're going to be covering now is questions relating to cell transport. So the type of stuff they're talking about here is diffusion, osmosis, active transport. You don't even have to know about um, facilitated diffusion, which you only learn at AS. Um, so yeah, just make sure you only... Um, uh, obviously, it's good to know extra stuff, but... For the purpose of this exam, throw all of that extra knowledge outside the window and just focus on what's on the syllabus, guys, uh, for the BMAT. Okay, so um, this is uh, from BMAT 2019, uh, surprisingly, the paper that I did uh, for my BMAT. So let's go through this one, guys. So question five, labels one, two, and three in the following diagram represent cellular processes. The shaded areas represent processes that can happen without the use of energy provided by cellular respiration and therefore ATP. So basically... Um, that means that two and three over here are going to be your passive processes whereas number one over here is going to be your active process right uh, and it says which uh, processes could one two and three um, represent 
So just a bit of background about this guy. So remember, I was talking about diff you have diffusion, you have osmosis, and you have active transport. Remember, active transport is against the concentration gradient. Diffusion and osmosis is down a concentration gradient. So from high to low, osmosis being the case basically with water, and you're moving through a semi-permeable um, membrane. So yeah, um, knowing that, guys, uh, give this question a shot and uh, resume once you're ready. Make sure you only give yourself a minute and yeah, good luck with that. Okay, welcome back, guys. Uh, yeah, so which boxes could labels one, two, and three represent? So we said two and three are passive. So if two and three are passive, they must be one of diffusion or osmosis, right? Um, and also, so with the options, guys, you have active transport, diffusion, osmosis, you have this uh, a weird thing which is popping up, which is aerobic respiration, right? Um, firstly, uh, that's irrelevant in this question, isn't it? Because um, aerobic respiration is what's providing the energy for active transport to occur. But a lot of students uh, in this question seem to be getting a bit confused. But aerobic respiration is actually an active process, right? So aerobic respiration is the process in which you make 32 molecules of ATP, isn't it? Um, but it is still an active process because you have to invest in some energy at the start before you get that large amount of ATP at the end. So that's just um, worth noting. But even if you didn't know that, guys, um, there will be an answer which doesn't include aerobic restriction heads up and therefore that um, that is the more feasible answer so um, yeah so yeah two and three must be um, passive processes so one looks good on that part and um, I think that's the so yeah that's that's basically the only option so two and three are the only um, in in uh, row a Two and three are um, passive processes, whereas in the other rows, uh, you have one of them being an, an active process. Obviously, one is an active process, uh, and therefore active transport is a good fit. So, yeah, the answer for this one, guys, uh, is A. Uh, as always, guys, if you ever get confused with what I'm saying, just drop a comment down below. I'll be happy um, to answer your queries. But other than that, hopefully that has made sense, and I'll see you in the next question. Okay, guys, um, so in the last um, section, we were looking at question 5, BMAT 2019. Uh, relatively straightforward question, but we move on, guys. So we're now going to move on to BMAT 2018, question 21. So we're expecting this to be a bit hard as it's towards the end. So this is I'm also uh, surrounded by a very dilute glucose solution. So actually, before we even start, whenever you see this sort of big um, passage sort of storytelling idea, it's always good to, before you even read this, have in your mind that you're probably going to need to draw a diagram to see what's going on. So an animal so surrounded by a very dilute glucose solution, which has a lower concentration of glucose, than the glucose solution in the cytoplasm of the cell. So let's just draw like a beaker. And in this beaker, we have a nice uh, oval animal cell. And in this animal cell, um, we have a high glucose concentration, right? And the, on the outside solution, let's just say, boom, that's the solution. We're going to have a low glucose solution. And since um, this is very dilute, we expect this to have a lot of water um, and the inside is... Uh, relatively going to have less water, right? Uh, and this says there's a net movement of glucose and water molecules into the cell. So what's happening is that into the cell we we have going water and glucose, right? And it says a second identical cell. So this is experiment one. Then you have experiment two. A second identical cell is treated for a short time with a chemical that inhibits respiration. So with two, you have no respiration, and the product of respiration is ATP. But if you have no respiration, you're going to have no ATP as a result of that. Um, the cell is surrounded then by the same, so it's basically the same, so the same thing, but just with that um, uh, caveat. And then it says, which role in the table shows the effect of this chemical on the movement of glucose molecules into the cell and the movement of water molecules across the cell surface membrane immediately after it's surrounded by the solution? So, um, yeah, give this a shot, guys, uh, and um, be happy to resume uh, once you've had your answer and you've given yourself a minute. So welcome back, guys. So here it's asking us for the net movement of glucose and a net movement uh, of water molecules. The reason why I really um, am emphasizing that is you're going to see, I think, in in a question or two's time why I'm emphasizing that. Um, but yeah, so basically, we know glucose and water is moving into the cell. But in the outside solution, the extracellular solution, we have low glucose. And in the intracellular solution, you have high glucose. So that means for glucose to go inside the cell, it must be going against the concentration gradient, and therefore this one must be going in by active transport. Whereas water, um, water is going from a, a high outside 
um, high water potential outside to low water potential inside. Water potential just refers to, it's like basically the concentration of water, how much water you have. Um, and yeah, so it's going down the water potential gradient and that should be a passive um, osmosis. Right. So basically, when you have uh, when you inhibit respiration in the second stream and you have no ATP, that means you're going to halt the active transport, whereas the osmosis is still fine to go. So the net movement of water would still um, move into the cell. So now we're left with A, B, yeah, A and B. Right. Whereas, um, yeah, so with the glucose now, um, you can't have active transport. So basically it won't move. So it doesn't move at all. So the right answer here, guys, is going to be uh, answer A. Um, in the past, when I was um, tutoring before, some questions, some students asked me, why wouldn't you say glucose um, is going to move out of the cell? Because surely there's high um, inside the cell and low outside of the cell. Firstly, that option of it um, going out of the cell is not even present. It's either it doesn't go in or it doesn't move. And secondly, it could be the case that, um, so since glucose, so basically passive diffusion happens with lipid soluble, non-polar stuff, but glucose is polar. Therefore, you need facilitated diffusion and therefore you need channels. And it might be the case that this cell doesn't have the channels to move glucose um, outside of the cell. So, yeah, hopefully I've answered all your queries. Again, if you have any questions, guys, comment down below. Happy to help you out. And yeah, I'll see you in the next question. OK, guys, we're doing really well. So before this, we looked at a bit of a, you know, experimental uh, question. BMAT 2018, where we were talking about. Um, ideas of cell transport. So we move on from there, guys. So now we're on to um, BMAT 2017. This is a really important um, question, guys, to really understand what the BMAT is testing. So question nine says the diagram below shows four experiment using investigate movement of substances across a dialysis tube. So basically, a dialysis tube is just a tube which has a load of small holes in it, which allow certain stuff through but not others. So you can demonstrate that something like that. And it says uh, the this tubing is partially permeable membrane, which allows both, so it's designed to allow both glucose and water to pass through. Number four experiments. Which one of the table shows the experiments where there will be movement of glucose molecules uh, through the partially permeable membrane, and the experiments where there will be movement of water through the partially permeable membrane? So pause it, guys. Uh, have a shot at the question, give yourself a minute, and come back when ready. So welcome back, guys. Let's consider this. So. In experiment one, we basically have distilled water, basically pure water um, outside, of this, outside of the tube and inside the tubing. Um, that is the dialysis tubing and not the test tube. Um, therefore, um, there's no water potential uh, gradient, isn't it? Because you have the same thing in and out. So there'll be no osmosis, isn't it? Because osmosis for osmosis, you require water potential difference, but there is no difference. So you have no osmosis. Therefore, there is no net movement of water molecules, but there is water movement of water molecules and this is what the question is asking for where there is just mere movement of water molecules basically what will be happening in experiment one is like there'll be five water molecules moving out but at the same token there'll be five water molecules moving in so there's no net movement because those cancel out but there is still movement so this is what i meant um really uh, taking the question don't overthink the question but really be careful with what is asking net movement or um just movement so yeah, there will be movement in experiment one. In experiment two, you have 10% glucose solution in and outside the tubing. Therefore, the other 90% is going to be water. And therefore, um, yeah, same thing. You have same water potential in and out and you have same glucose concentration in and out. So if one glucose moves, another glucose just come in. And if one uh, water molecule moves out, one water molecule would just move back in. So there's no net movement, but there is movement. So two would fit into both categories. Um, experiment three, you have distilled water, pure water outside, and you have 10% glucose solution and 90% water um, inside. So here there would actually be osmosis because um, the outside of the tubing, the dialysis tubing, has a higher water potential. Therefore, water would move in, right? Water would move in. Um, and that's going to be by the process of osmosis. And um, with glucose, um, you have 10% glucose in the tubing, but you have nothing, none of it outside. So glucose, therefore, would move out by the process of diffusion. So here you have net um, movement occurring, and therefore, um, three would um, accommodate both of these. Uh, experiment four, you might want to, you know, draw in uh, what's happening, but 
Really, guys, that's a waste of time. And basically, in the BMAT, you have to find little, little methods, you know, to save a couple of seconds. Trust me, guys, a couple of seconds in the BMAT can change your score by a couple of um, points. So it's really important that you spot uh, little tricks like this. Basically, what's happening in experiment four is just experiment three in reverse. So you have basically what's what's in the extracellular, what, what's in the extra tubular environment is now inside the tube and what's was inside the tube is now outside of the tube so rather than glucose moving out it would just move in and rather than water move in it would just move out and therefore uh, four also belongs to both of these so yeah the answer you should be getting guys uh is gonna be um e so hopefully that makes sense guys. again really important question hopefully you understood that again any queries just comment down below i'll be happy to help so yep looking forward to seeing you guys in the next question enjoy and we crack on. Okay, guys, in the previous uh, question, we were looking at this, uh, you know, interesting question and really honing in on what the BMAT is uh, sort of testing, a uh, really critical uh, reading of the question. So um, let's go to the next question. And this was BMAT 2012, uh, question 13. Basically, whenever you see this star, guys, this is a question which students uh, of mine and students in the past have uh, particularly found difficult, so it's worth um, looking at these ones. So it says, the left diagram shows a plate containing a jelly with one species of bacterium evenly spread through it. So basically, uh, you've probably seen these experiments before, but basically what happens is you have your Petri dish, and then you basically have um, agar painted all, all over it. This is agar is just food for bacteria. And then basically on top of that, uh, you paint on it your um, bacteria that you want to go, bacteria of interest. And it doesn't even have to be, uh, as I show, you can just pour it in like a little area. And as the bacteria divide, um, uh, basically by binary fission, um, they're going to populate the whole um, agar surface. All right. So and then, yeah. And then basically what you do is your idea is you want to test different antibiotics and how they work. So you get, let's just say this is antibiotic A. Basically, you get a circular disc, you dip that in antibiotic A and you place that disc um, on the plate. And basically what happens is um, the antibiotic from the disc diffuses outwards. So it diffuses outwards. And where, uh, if it's good enough, wherever it, kill, where, wherever it touches bacteria, it just kills them. And therefore, uh, you get like a clear ring around your uh, disc. Right. So it says place on the gels are three discs called PQ and R. They have been treated as in the key. The right shows the plate 48 hours later. So P, you have anti, um, they're all the same antibiotic, but P, you have quarter X strength, then Q, double that, half X strength, and R, uh, further double of that, which is going to be uh, X strength. So each time your concentration of uh, antibiotic is times in by two, right? And then it says, which of the following is our possible explanations for the result? So, um, yeah, guys, so um, pause the video, uh, give it a shot, come back after a minute, and we'll go through it. So let's consider this, guys. So it says antibiotics are said X and half X are equally as effective. Uh, so that's where comparing Q and R. So basically effectiveness, the proxy for effectiveness is, uh, so effectiveness is basically equal to clear area, right? And as you can see uh, in Q and R, the clear area around the disc is the same. And therefore we can conclude they are equally as effective. So that's true. And then it says bacterial resistance to this antibiotic occurs at um, all three strengths. Um, that's clearly uh, incorrect because you have some clear area in Q and R. It is resistant at strength P because there's no clear area, so it's uh, it's not able to kill the bacteria. But the other two, you're certainly getting some killing. So um, this is false. And the reason why you might not be getting some killing at um, disc P is that it's at the lowest concentration. So maybe is there's like a threshold effect anything above this concentration and then the bacteria um would be killed but that's probably that's, that's just me um suggesting stuff right and then uh free says s may represent um the maximum distance the antibiotic has diffused um out of the disc right so um yeah so one key thing guys is when the answer let's just say r r was at strength x the antibiotic is going to diffuse outwards isn't it right but as you diffuse outwards, basically, your concentration of your antibiotic drops off, right? So uh, it's going to be X at the uh, disc, but then maybe a bit further out will be half X, and then even more further out will be quarter X. Something along those lines is basically what happens, right? So um, with R, so maybe at this point, it probably reached, you know, half X as the concentration, but that's still able to uh, kill bacteria. And we know that because you have some clear area uh, around Q. 
So yeah, um, it is a it is a possibility that S represents the maximum distance it diffuses because if it can't diffuse further than that, then it's not it's not going to touch bacteria. And if it, the antibiotic doesn't touch bacteria, um, it's not going to be killed. So this is a, a, a possible uh, explanation, right? Another explanation could be that probably at that point the concentration uh, it reaches too low to be effective. Basically, is under 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 that threshold. Um, so yeah, so one and three is I think the answer is going to be here, and therefore uh, your answer here is going to be E, guys. So hopefully that was useful. This is an interesting question. Really examines your you know sort of critical thinking area of the brain. But um, hopefully that was helpful, guys. And I actually think uh, yeah we have a couple of more questions, guys, to do if so transport. And then we could, uh, you know, move on to the next topic. So I hope to see you in the next one. OK, guys, um, in the previous section, we we're looking at BMAT 2012, uh, question 13, which is an interesting question because it really tests um, your lateral thinking rather than just your recall of uh, information. So we move on to the next question, guys. So the next one was BMAT 2011, question 13. Um, this question is related to, uh, you know, this idea of diffusion and stuff, but it also kind of un uh, requires some understanding of, you know, how the blood system works, but we'll go through that. So it says, the table below shows information related to gas exchange in an active muscle when blood first enters that muscle. So what it's talking about here is basically, guys, you have arteries, right? So you have, um, so these are your arteries, and then your arteries branch off into uh, smaller arterioles. Right, and then from your arterioles, guys. So let's just extend that a bit. And then from your arterioles, guys, you have your capillary, and your capillary bed. Capillary bed basically is the network of capillary vessels, which are basically the site of um, you know transfer and stuff. And then from there, guys, you have your venules. Right, and from your venules, guys, you again become larger, and then that comes your veins, and your veins eventually uh, go back to the heart. Right. And obviously your arteries are coming from the heart as well, right? So, um, yeah, so when it says, guys, uh, when blood first enters that muscle, it's talking about basically the blood coming in from here. And let's just say, to draw the muscles a block. Obviously your muscle is not in this shape, but let, yeah, let's just consider a, a schematic like that, right? So, um, yeah, so that should be sufficient information, guys. Give this question a shot. Come back after a minute and check your um, answer with mine and see if you've understood everything correctly. So see you in a bit. So um, it says, which row on the table um, is correct? So we, we know basically, guys, that this muscle is active, right? If this muscle is active, that must mean it's doing a lot of aerobic respiration. And therefore, that means two things. There's low oxygen in this cell. Um, and also, there's a lot of carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide is the byproduct of um, uh, aerobic, aerobic respiration, isn't it? So the concentration of carbon dioxide in the plasma. So this is, um, so at this stage, guys, over here, uh, this is fresh blood that's coming from the heart that's just been um, oxygenated in the lungs and you've taken out the CO2 as well. So concentration of carbon dioxide in the plasma, uh, this is going to be high, obviously. Right? This is fresh blood. Oxygen concentration in the red blood cells, right? So remember, red blood cells is where you carry uh, the oxygen, uh, particularly in hemoglobin. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically, whoops, actually, I've got that wrong completely, haven't I? Uh, let's just fix that. So let's fix this and uh, let's switch on to the pen. Yeah, so that I've actually got that one. So concentration of carbon dioxide should actually be low, isn't it? Right, because it's fresh blood, you just taken away the CO2 at the level of the lungs. Uh, oxygen concentration in your red blood cell should be high, right? That was good enough. Uh, and then a uh, process of gas exchange. Remember, gases are basically lipid soluble, they're uh, non-polar, so there's going to be diffusion. And the osmosis is basically for water, right? And then oxygen concentration in your muscle cells is really active. Uh, we therefore know it's going to be uh, low, right? And then uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in muscle cells is going to be high because it's just been really active. And basically, for which option have I circled all of them? Um, that's going to be E then, isn't it, guys? So, yeah, so uh, pretty straightforward, guys. Um, as you can see, you know... <laughs> I made a little mistake there, so it's always just, you know, good to avoid that for them kind of things. But other than that, uh, pretty straightforward. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I actually think this is the end of the cell, cell transport series of questions. Yeah, the next section is cell division, which we'll be moving swiftly on to um, in the next video, actually. So this is the end of uh, this video, guys. Hopefully it was helpful. If you want more things like this, 
um, uh, then yeah, feel free to comment down below and I can always add further questions, whether it be BMAP from other syllabuses. Uh, for example, the NSAA has similar questions to this and there's this other thing called the IMA. I can add all of those guys and together we can uh, smash this exam. So hopefully that has been helpful, guys. And see you in the next one.